more, and eventually, something far better. I'll turn you loose in wide open spaces, with more than enough fertile and productive land for everyone. Don't let Hezekiah mislead you with his lies. God will save us. Has that ever happened? Has any god in history ever gotten the best of the king of Assyria? Look around you. Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpan? The gods of Sepharvaim? Did the gods do anything for Samaria? Name one god that has ever saved its countries from me. So what makes you think that God could save Jerusalem from me? The three men were silent. They said nothing, for the king had already commanded. Don't answer him. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shemna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the court historian, tearing their clothes in defeat and despair, went back and reported what the Reb Shekah had said to Hezekiah. Chapter 37 The Only God There Is When King Hezekiah heard the report, he also tore his clothes and dressed in rough, penitential burlap gunny sacks and went into the sanctuary of God. He sent Eliakim, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and the senior priests, all of them also dressed in penitential burlap, to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They said to him, Hezekiah says, this is a black day. We're in crisis. We're like pregnant women without even the strength to have a baby. Do you think your God heard what the Rabshakeh said, sent by his master, the king of Assyria, to mock the living God? And do you think your God will do anything about it? Pray for us, Isaiah. Pray for those of us left here holding the fort. Then King Hezekiah's servants came to Isaiah. Isaiah said, Tell your master this, God's message. Don't be upset by what you've heard, all those words the servants of the Assyrian king have used to mock me. I personally will take care of him. I'll arrange it so that he'll get a rumor of bad news back home and rush home to take care of it and he'll die there, kill a violent death. The Ramshaka left and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna. He had gotten word that the king had left Lachish. Just then, the Assyrian king received an intelligence report on King Terhega of Ethiopia. He is on his way to make war on you. On hearing that, he sent messengers to Hezekiah with instructions to deliver this message. Don't let your God, on whom you so naively lean, deceive you, promising that Jerusalem won't fall to the king of Assyria. Use your head. Look around at what the kings of Assyria have done all over the world, one country after another, devastated. And do you think you're going to get off? Have any of the gods of any of these countries ever stepped in and saved them? Even one of these nations my predecessors destroyed. Gozen, Haran, Rezeph, and the people of Eden who lived in Telassar? Look around. Do you see anything left of the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sepharvaim, the king of Hena, the king of Iva? Hezekiah took the letter from the hands of the messengers and read it. Then he went into the sanctuary of God and spread the letter out before God. Then Hezekiah prayed to God, God of the angel armies, enthroned over the cherubim angels. You are God, the only God there is, God of all kingdoms on earth. You made heaven and earth. Listen, O God, and hear. Look, O God, and see. Mark all these words of Sennacherib that he sent to mock the living God. It's quite true, O God, that the kings of Assyria have devastated all the nations and their lands. They've thrown their gods into the trash and burned them. No great achievement since there were no gods anyway. Gods made in workshops, carved from wood and chiseled from rock. An end to the no gods. But now step in, O God, our God. Save us from him. Let all the kingdoms of earth know that you and you alone are God. Then Isaiah, son of Amos, sent this word to Hezekiah. God's message, the God of Israel. Because you brought King Sennacherib of Assyria to me in prayer. Here is my answer, God's answer. She has no use for you, Sennacherib. Nothing but contempt, this virgin daughter, Zion. She spits at you and turns on her heel, this daughter, Jerusalem. Who do you think you've been mocking and reviling all these years? Who do you think you've been jeering and treating with such utter contempt all these years? The Holy of Israel. You've used your servants to mock the Master. 
You've bragged, with my fleet of chariots, I've gone to the highest mountain ranges, penetrated the far reaches of Lebanon, chopped down its giant cedars, its finest cypresses. I conquered its highest peak, explored its deepest forest. I dug wells and drank my fill. I emptied the famous rivers of Egypt with one kick of my foot. Haven't you gotten the news that I've been behind this all along? This is a long-standing plan of mine, and I'm just now making it happen using you to devastate strong cities, turning them into piles of rubble, and leaving their citizens helpless, bewildered and confused, drooping like unwatered plants, stunted like withered seedlings. I know all about your pretentious poses, your officious comings and goings, and yes, the tantrums you throw against me. Because of all your wild raging against me, your unbridled arrogance that I keep hearing of, I'll put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth. I'll show you who's boss. I'll turn you around and take you back to where you came from. And this, Hezekiah, will be your confirming sign. This year's crops will be slim pickings. And next year, it won't be much better. But in three years, farming will be back to normal, with regular sowing and reaping, planting and harvesting. What's left of the people of Judah will put down roots and make a new start. The people left in Jerusalem will get moving again. Mount Zion survivors will take hold again. The zeal of God of the angel armies will do all this. Finally, this is God's verdict on the king of Assyria. Don't worry, he won't enter this city. Won't let loose a single arrow. Won't brandish so much as one shield, let alone build a siege ramp against it. He'll go back the same way he came. He won't set a foot in this city. God's decree. I've got my hand on this city to save it, save it for my very own sake, but also for the sake of my David dynasty. Then the angel of God arrived and struck the Assyrian camp. 185,000 Assyrians died. By the time the sun came up, they were all dead, an army of corpses. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, got out of there fast, back home to Nineveh. As he was worshipping in the sanctuary of his god, Nishrab, he was murdered by his sons, Adramelech and Sherezer. They escaped to the land of Ararat. His son, Esar Hayden, became the next king. Chapter 38 Time spent in death's waiting room. At that time, Hezekiah got sick. He was about to die. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, visited him and said, God says, Prepare your affairs and your family. This is it. You're going to die. You're not going to get well. Hezekiah turned away from Isaiah and, facing the wall, prayed to God, God, please, I beg you, remember how I've lived my life. I've lived faithfully in your presence, lived out of a heart that was totally yours. You've seen how I've lived, the good that I have done. And Hezekiah wept as he prayed, painful tears. Then God told Isaiah, go and speak with Hezekiah. Give him this message from me, God, the God of your ancestor, David. I've heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Here's what I'll do. I'll add 15 years to your life, and I'll save both you and this city from the king of Assyria. I have my hand on this city. And this is your confirming sign, confirming that I, God, will do exactly what I have promised. Watch for this. As the sun goes down and the shadow lengthens on the sundial of Ahaz, I'm going to reverse the shadow 10 notches on the dial. And that's what happened. The declining sun's shadow reversed ten notches on the dial. This is what Hezekiah, king of Judah, wrote after he'd been sick and then recovered from his sickness. In the very prime of life, I have to leave. Whatever time I have left is spent in death's waiting room. No more glimpses of God in the land of the living. No more meetings with my neighbors. No more rubbing shoulders with friends. This body I inhabit is taken down and packed away like a camper's tent. Like a weaver, I've rolled up the carpet of my life as God cuts me free of the loom, and at day's end, sweeps up the scraps and pieces. I cry for help until morning. Like a lion, God pummels and pounds me, relentlessly finishing me off. I squawk like a doomed hen, moan like a dove. My eyes ache from looking up for help. Master, I'm in trouble. Get me out of this. What's the use? God himself gave me the word. He's done it to me. I can't sleep. I'm that upset. 
have trouble. Oh, Master, these are the conditions in which people live. And yes, in these very conditions, my spirit is still alive, fully recovered with a fresh infusion of life. It seems it was good for me to go through all those troubles. Throughout them all, you held tight to my lifeline. You never let me tumble over the edge into nothing. But my sins you let go of, threw them over your shoulder. Good riddance. The dead don't thank you, and choirs don't sing praises from the morgue. Those buried six feet under don't witness to your faithful ways. It's the living, live men, live women who thank you, just as I'm doing right now. Parents give their children full reports on your faithful ways. God saves and will save me. As fiddles and mandolins strike up the tunes, we'll sing, oh, we'll sing, sing, for the rest of our lives in the sanctuary of God. Isaiah had said, prepare a poultice of figs and put it on the boil so he may recover. Hezekiah had said, what is my cue that it's all right to enter again in the sanctuary of God? Chapter 39. There will be nothing left. Sometime later, King Merodach Baladin, son of Baladin of Babylon, sent messengers with greetings and a gift to Hezekiah. He had heard that Hezekiah had been sick and was now well. Hezekiah received the messengers warmly. He took them on a tour of his royal precincts, proudly showing them all his treasures, silver, gold, spices, expensive oils, all his weapons, everything out on display. There was nothing in his house or kingdom that Hezekiah didn't show them. Later, the prophet Isaiah showed up. He asked Hezekiah, What are these men up to? What did they say? And where did they come from? Hezekiah said, They came from a long way off, from Babylon. And what did they see in your palace? Everything, said Hezekiah. I showed them the works, opened all the doors, and impressed them with it all. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, listen to this message from God of the angel armies. I have to warn you, the time is coming when everything in this palace, along with everything your ancestors accumulated before you, will be hauled off to Babylon. God says that there will be nothing left, nothing, and not only your things, but your sons. Some of your sons will be taken into exile, ending up as eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Hezekiah replied to Isaiah, Good. If God says so, it's good. Within himself, he was thinking, but surely nothing bad will happen in my lifetime. I'll enjoy peace and stability as long as I live. Messages of Comfort Chapter 40 Prepare for God's Arrival Comfort O comfort my people, says your God. Speak softly and tenderly to Jerusalem, but also make it very clear that she has served her sentence, that her sin is taken care of, forgiven. She's been punished enough and more than enough, and now it's over and done with. Thunder in the desert, prepare for God's arrival. Make the road straight and smooth, a highway fit for our God. Fill in the valleys, level off the hills, smooth out the ruts, clear out the rocks. Then God's bright glory will shine and everyone will see it. Yes, just as God has said. A voice says, shout. I said, what shall I shout? These people are nothing but grass. They're love, fragile as wildflowers. The grass withers, the wildflowers fade, yet God so much as puffs on them. Aren't these people just so much grass? True, the grass withers and the wildflowers fade, but our God's word stands firm forever. Climb a high mountain, Zion. You're the preacher of good news. Raise your voice. Make it good and loud, Jerusalem. You're the preacher of good news. Speak loud and clear. Don't be timid. Tell the cities of Judah, look, your God. Look at him. God, the master, comes in power, ready to go into action. He's going to pay back his enemies and reward those who have loved him. Like a shepherd, he will care for his flock, gathering the lambs in his arms, hugging them as he carries them, leading the nursing ewes to good pasture. The creator of all you can see or imagine. Who has scooped up the ocean in his two hands, or measured the sky between his thumb and little finger? Who has put all the earth's dirt in one of his baskets, weighed each mountain and hill? Who could ever have told God what to do, or taught him his business? What expert would he have gone to for advice? What school would he attend to learn justice? What God do 
you suppose might have taught him what he knows, showed him how things work. Why, the nations are but a drop in a bucket, a mere smudge on a window. Watch him sweep up the islands like so much dust off the floor. There aren't enough trees in Lebanon, nor enough animals in those vast forests to furnish adequate fuel and offerings for his worship. All the nations add up to simply nothing before him. Less than nothing is more like it, a minus. So who even comes close to being like God? To whom or what can you compare him? Some no-God idol? Ridiculous. It's made in a workshop, cast in bronze, given a thin veneer of gold, and draped with silver filigree. Or perhaps someone will select a fine wood, olive wood, say, that won't rot. Then hire a woodcarver to make a no-God, giving special care to its base so it won't tip over. Have you not been paying attention? Have you not been listening? Haven't you heard these stories all your life? Don't you understand the foundation of all things? God sits high above the round ball of earth. The people look like mere ants. He stretches out the skies like a canvas. Yes, like a tent canvas to live under. He ignores what all the princes say and do. The rulers of the earth count for nothing. Princes and rulers don't amount to much. Like seeds barely rooted, just sprouted. They shrivel when God blows them. Like flecks of chaff, they're gone with the wind. So, who is like me? Who holds a candle to me, says the holy? Look at the night skies. Who do you think made all this? Who marches this army of stars out each night, counts them off, calls each by name, so magnificent, so powerful, and never overlooks a single one? Why would you ever complain, O Jacob, or whine, Israel, saying, God has lost track of me. He doesn't care what happens to me. Don't you know anything? Haven't you been listening? God doesn't come and go. God lasts. He's creator of all you can see or imagine. He doesn't get tired out, doesn't pause to catch his breath. He knows everything, inside and out. He energizes those who get tired, gives fresh strength to dropouts. For even young people tire and drop out. Young folk in their prime stumble and fall. Those who wait upon God get fresh strength. They spread their wings and soar like eagles. They run and don't get tired. They walk and don't lag behind. Chapter 41. Do you feel like a lowly worm? Quiet down, far-flung ocean islands. Listen. Sit down and rest, everyone. Recover your strength. Gather around me. Say what's on your heart. Together. Let's decide what's right. Who got things rolling here? Got this champion from the east on the moon. Who recruited him for this job? Then rounded up and corralled the nations so he could run roughshod over kings. He's off and running, pulverizing nations into dust, leaving only stubble and chaff in his wake. He chases them and comes through unscathed, his feet scarcely touching the path. Who did this? Who made it happen? Who always gets things started? God, I'm first on the scene. I'm also the last to leave. Far-flung ocean islands see it and panic. The ends of the earth are shaken. Fearfully, they huddle together. They try to help each other out, making up stories in the dark. The godmakers in the workshops go into overtime production, crafting new models of no gods, urging one another on. Good job, great design. Pounding in nails at the base so that the things won't tip over. But you... Israel are my servant. You're Jacob, my first choice, descendants of my good friend Abraham. I pulled you in from all over the world, called you in from every dark corner of the earth, telling you, you're my servant, serving on my side. I thanked you. I haven't dropped you. Don't panic. I'm with you. There's no need to fear, for I'm your God. I'll give you strength. I'll help you. I'll hold you steady. Keep a firm grip. Everyone who had it in for you will end up out in the cold, real losers. Those who worked against you will end up empty-handed, nothing to show for their lives. When you go out looking for your old adversaries, you won't find them. Not a trace of your old enemies, not even a memory. That's right, because I, your God, have a firm grip on you, and I'm not letting go. I'm telling you, don't panic. I'm right here to help you. Do you feel like a lowly worm, Jacob? Don't be afraid. 
feel like a fragile insect, Israel? I'll help you. I, God, want to reassure you. The God who binds you back. The Holy of Israel. I'm transforming you from worm to harrow, from insect to iron. As a sharp-toothed harrow, you'll smooth out the mountains, turn those tough old hills into loamy soil. You'll open the rough ground to the weather, to the blasts of sun and wind and rain. But you'll be confident and exuberant, expansive in the holy of Israel. The poor and homeless are desperate for water, their tongues parched and no water to be found. But I'm there to be found. I'm there for them. And I, God of Israel, will not leave them thirsty. I'll open up rivers for them on the barren hills, spout fountains in the valleys. I'll turn the baked clay badlands into a cool pond, the waterless waste into splashing creeks. I'll plant the red cedar in that treeless wasteland, also acacia, myrtle, and olive. I'll place the cypress in the desert with plenty of oaks and pines. Everyone will see this. No one can miss it. Unavoidable, indisputable evidence that I, God, personally did this. It's created and signed by the Holy of Israel. Set out your case for your gods, says God. Bring your evidence, says the king of Jacob. Take the stand on behalf of your idols. Offer arguments. Assemble reasons. Spread out the facts before us so that we can assess them ourselves. Ask them, if you are gods, explain what the past means. Or, failing that, tell us what will happen in the future. Can't do that? How about doing something? Anything? Good or bad, whatever. Can you hurt us or help us? Do we need to be afraid? They say nothing because they are nothing. Sham gods, no gods, fool-making gods. I, God, started someone out from the north, and he's come. He was called out of the east by name. He'll stomp the rulers into the mud, the way a potter works the clay. Let me ask you, did anyone guess that this might happen? Did anyone tell us earlier so we might confirm it with, yes, he's right? No one mentioned it. No one announced it. No one heard a peep out of you. But I told Zion all about this beforehand. I gave Jerusalem a preacher of good news. But around here, there's no one. No one who knows what's going on. I ask, but no one can tell me the score. Nothing here. It's all smoke and hot air. Sham gods. Hollow gods. No gods. Chapter 42. God's servant will set everything right. Take a good look at my servant. I'm backing him to the hill. He's the one I chose, and I couldn't be more pleased with him. I bathed him with my spirit, my life. He'll set everything right among the nations. He won't call attention to what he does with loud speeches or gaudy parades. He won't brush aside the bruised and the hurt, and he won't disregard the small and insignificant. But he'll steadily and firmly set things right. He won't tire out and quit. He won't be stopped until he's finished his work to set things right on earth. Far-flung ocean islands wait expectantly for his teaching. The God who makes us alive with his own life. God's message. The God who created the cosmos, stretched out the skies, laid out the earth and all that grows from it, who breathes life into earth's people, makes them alive with his own life. I am God. I have called you to live right and well. I have taken responsibility for you, kept you safe. I have set you among my people to bind them to me and provided you as a lighthouse to the nations, to make a start at bringing people into the open, into life, opening blind eyes, releasing prisoners from dungeons, emptying the dark prisons. I am God. That's my name. I don't franchise my glory. Don't endorse the no-God idols. Take note. The earlier predictions of judgment have been fulfilled. I'm announcing the new salvation work. Before it bursts on the scene, I'm telling you all about it. Sing to God a brand new song. Sing his praises all over the world. Let the sea and its fish give a round of applause, with all the far-flung islands joining in. Let the desert and its camps raise a tune, calling the Keter nomads to join in. Let the villages in Sela round up a choir and perform from the tops of the mountains. Make God's glory resound. Echo his praises from coast to coast. God steps out like he means business. You can see he's primed for action. He shouts, announcing his arrival. 
He takes charge, and his enemies fall into line. I've been quiet long enough. I've held back, biting my tongue. Now, I'm letting loose, letting go, like a woman who's having a baby, stripping the hills bare, withering the wildflowers, drying up the rivers, turning lakes into mud flats. But I'll take the hand of those who don't know the way, who can't see where they're going. I'll be a personal guide to them, directing them through unknown country. I'll be right there to show them what roads to take, make sure they don't fall into the ditch. These are the things I'll be doing for them, sticking with them, not leaving them for a minute. Those who invested in the no gods are bankrupt, dead broke. You've seen a lot, but looked at nothing. Pay attention. Are you deaf? Open your eyes. Are you blind? You're my servant, and you're not looking. You're my messenger, and you're not listening. The very people I depended upon, servants of God, blind as a bat, willfully blind. You've seen a lot, but looked at nothing. You've heard everything, but listened to nothing. God intended, out of the goodness of his heart, to be lavish in his revelation. But this is a people battered and cowed, shut up in attics and closets, victims licking their wounds, feeling ignored, abandoned. But is anyone out there listening? Is anyone paying attention to what's coming? Who do you think turned Jacob over to the thugs, let loose the robbers on Israel? Wasn't it God himself? This God against whom we've sinned, not doing what he commanded, not listening to what he said. Isn't it God's anger that's behind all this? God's punishing power? Their whole world collapsed, but they still didn't get it. Their life is in ruins, but they don't take it to heart. Isaiah, chapter 43. When you were between a rock and a hard place. But now, God's message. The God who made you in the first place, Jacob, the one who got you started, Israel. Don't be afraid. I've redeemed you. I've called your name. You're mine. When you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you will not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end. Because I am God, your personal God, the Holy of Israel, your Savior a huge price for you. All of Egypt, with rich Cush and Seba thrown in. That's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. I'd sell off the whole world to get you back. Trade the creation just for you. So don't be afraid. I'm with you. I'll round up all your scattered children, pull them in from east and west. I'll send orders north and south. Send them back. Return my sons from distant lands, my daughters from faraway places. I want them back, every last one who bears my name, every man, woman, and child whom I created for my glory. Yes, personally formed and made each one. Get the blind and deaf out here and ready. The blind, well, there's nothing wrong with their eyes. And the deaf, well, there's nothing wrong with their ears. Then, get the other nations out here and ready. Let's see what they have to say about this, how they account for what's happened. Let them present their expert witnesses and make their case. Let them try to convince us what they say is true. But you are my witnesses, God's decree. You're my hand-picked servant so that you'll come to know and trust me, understand both that I am and who I am. Previous to me, there was no such thing as a God, nor will there be after me. I. Yes, I am God. I'm the only Savior there is. I spoke. I saved. I told you what existed long before these upstart gods appeared on the scene. And you know it. You're my witnesses. You're the evidence. God's decree. Yes, I am God. I've always been God. And I always will be God. No one can take anything from me. I make. Who can unmake it? You didn't even do the minimum. God, your Redeemer, the Holy of Israel, says, Just for you, I will march on Babylon. I'll turn the tables on the Babylonians. Instead of whooping it up, they'll be wailing. I am God, your Holy One, Creator of Israel, your King. This is what God says, the God who builds a road right through the ocean, 
who carves a path through pounding waves. The god who summons horses and chariots and armies. They lie down and they can't get up. They're snuffed out like so many candles. Forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert. Be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. I'm making a road through the desert. Rivers in the badlands. Wild animals will say thank you. The coyotes and the buzzards. Because I provided water in the desert. Rivers and the sun-baked earth. Drinking water for the people I chose. The people I made especially for myself. A people custom made to praise me. You didn't pay a bit of attention to me, Jacob. You're so quickly tired of me, Israel. You wouldn't even bring sheep for offerings and worship. You couldn't be bothered with sacrifices. It wasn't that I asked that much from you. I didn't expect expensive presents. But you didn't even do the minimum. So stingy with me. So close-fisted. If you haven't been stingy with your sins, you've been plenty generous with them. I'm fed up. But I... Yes, I am the one who takes care of your sins. That's what I do. I don't keep a list of your sins. So, make your case against me. Let's have this out. Make your arguments. Prove you're in the right. Your original ancestor started the sinning, and everyone since has joined in. That's why I had to disqualify the temple leaders, repudiate Jacob, and discredit Israel. Chapter 44 proud to be called Israel. But for now, dear servant Jacob, listen. Yes, you, Israel, my personal choice. God who made you has something to say to you. The God who formed you in the womb wants to help you. Don't be afraid, dear servant Jacob. Jeshurun, the one I chose. For I will pour water on the thirsty ground and send streams coursing through the parched earth. I will pour my spirit into your descendants and my blessing on your children. They shall sprout like grass on the prairie, like willows alongside creeks. This one will say, I am God's, and another will go by the name Jacob. That one will write on his hand, God's property, and be proud to be called Israel. God, King of Israel, your Redeemer, God of the angel armies, says, I'm first, I'm last, and everything in between. I'm the only God there is. Who compares with me? Speak up. See if you measure up. From the beginning, who else has always announced what's coming? So what is coming next? Anybody want to venture a try? Don't be afraid and don't worry. Haven't I always kept you informed, told you what was going on? You're my eyewitnesses. Have you ever come across a God, a real God, other than me? There's no rock like me that I know of. Lover of emptiness. All those who make no God idols don't amount to a thing. And what they work so hard at making is nothing. Their little puppet gods see nothing and know nothing. They're total embarrassments. Who would bother making gods that can't do anything, that can't God? Watch all the no God worshippers hide their faces in shame. Watch the no God makers slink off humiliated when their idols fail them. Get them out here in the open. Make them face God reality. The blacksmith makes his no god, works it over in his forge, hammering it on his anvil. Such hard work. He works away, fatigued with hunger and thirst. The woodworker draws up plans for his no god, traces it on a block of wood. He shapes it with chisels and planes in human shape. A beautiful woman, a handsome man, ready to be placed in a chapel. He first cuts down a cedar, or maybe picks out a pine or oak, and lets it grow strong in the forest nourished by the rain. Then it can serve a double purpose. Part he uses as firewood for keeping warm and baking bread. From the other part, he makes a god that he worships, carves it into a god shape, and prays before it. With half, he makes a fire to warm himself and barbecue his supper. He eats his fill and sits back satisfied with his stomach full and his feet warmed by the fire. Ah, this is the life. And he still has half left for a god made to his personal design, a handy, convenient, no god to worship, whenever so inclined. Whenever the need strikes him, he prays to it, Save me, you're my god. Pretty stupid, wouldn't you say? Don't they have eyes in their heads? Are their brains working at all? Doesn't it occur to them to say, 
Half of this tree I used for firewood. I baked bread, roasted meat, and enjoyed a good meal. And now I've used the rest to make an abominable no god. Here I am praying to a stick of wood. This lover of emptiness, of nothing, is so out of touch with reality, so far gone that he can't even look at what he's doing, can't even look at the no god stick of wood in his hand and say, this is crazy. Remember these things, O Jacob. Take it seriously, Israel. You're my servant. I made you, shaped you. You are my servant. O Israel, I'll never forget you. I've wiped the slate of all your wrongdoings. There's nothing left of your sins. Come back to me. Come back. I've redeemed you. High heaven, sing. God has done it. Deep earth, shout. And you mountains, sing. A forest choir of oaks and pines and cedars. God has redeemed Jacob. God's glory is on display in Israel. God, your Redeemer, who shaped your life in your mother's womb, says, I am God. I made all that is. With no help from you, I spread out the skies and laid out the earth. He makes the magicians look ridiculous and turns fortune tellers into jokes. He makes the experts look trivial and their latest knowledge look silly. But he backs the word of his servant and confirms the counsel of his messengers. He says to Jerusalem, be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah, be rebuilt, and to the ruins, I raise you up. He says to Ocean, dry up, I'm drying up your rivers. He says to Cyrus, my shepherd, everything I want, you'll do it. He says to Jerusalem, be built, and to the temple, be established. Chapter 45, the God who forms light and darkness. God's message to his anointed, to Cyrus, whom he took by the hand to give the task of taming the nations, of terrifying their kings. He gave him free reign, no restrictions. I'll go ahead of you, clearing and paving the road. I'll break down bronze city gates, smash padlocks, kick down barred entrances. I'll lead you to buried treasures, secret caches of valuables, confirmations that it is, in fact, I, God, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. It's because of my dear servant Jacob, Israel, my chosen, that I've singled you out, called you my name, and given you this privileged work. You don't even know me. I am God, the only God there is. Besides me, there are no real gods. I'm the one who armed you for this work, but you don't even know me so that everyone from east to west will know that I have no God rivals. I am God, the only God there is. I form light and create darkness. I make harmonies and create discords. I, God, do all these things. Open up heavens and rain. Clouds, pour out buckets of my goodness. Loosen up earth and bloom salvation. Sprout right living. I, God, generate all this. But doom to you who fight your maker. You're a pot at odds with the potter. Does clay talk back to the potter? What are you doing? What clumsy fingers? What a sperm say to a father? Who gave you permission to use me to make a baby? Or a fetus to a mother? Why have you cooped me up in this belly? Thus God, the Holy of Israel, Israel's maker, says, Do you question who or what I'm making? Are you telling me what I can or can 